Hello, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jonah from Spotlight, and today we are talking to Thomas. Thomas, how are you doing today? I feel great, man. Really, really good. It's been do uh, really fun doing these webinars with you, man. Yeah, and uh, so I wanted to call that out for everyone watching here. Please go look. We've done an event with Thomas Tuesday, Wednesday, and now today. So we've had three events this whole week. The first yep. one, we dove into just general 3D making. Then we got deep into Blender yesterday. And today we're going to be diving into Unity and super stoked to be doing so. And just going to call out a couple things. If you're here, hop in the comments. Let us know if you can hear and see us all right, where you're tuning in from, something you're excited to learn, maybe how you heard about Thomas or Spotlight. We love hearing all of those things. And if you're watching the replay, do the same. We do come back to those comments and love seeing where you're at. And if this event is moving fast, Thomas has a lot to offer today, or you have to get up away from the computer, you want to review anything, don't fret. There will be a replay. It'll be on YouTube, on the Spotlight event page, and also emailed to you along with the course offer, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And just to make sure everyone's in the right place, like I said, we're talking to Thomas today about how to create 3D art free and fast, and we're going to be focusing on the Unity aspect today. Thomas, I want to get out of the way because I know you got a lot to show us today. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Yeah. Well, guys, this is going to be a really fun day. I've been looking forward to this one um, because we're just going to open up Unity and we're literally going to paint terrain. It's a really weird thing to say. And maybe some of you are familiar with this, um, but we're going to paint a 3D world and we're going to do it fast. Um, the, the best part is you could paint with no real 3D skills. Just basically learn Unity just a little bit, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so the overview here is pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to talk first. This, this is something I was thinking about today. I was like, I really want to talk about the skybox. So skybox and the effects associated with just the world, and creating an ambience, they're huge. They're, I would say they're like, if they're not there, your world is not going to look pretty. A skybox is... The, it's basically a sphere or an algorithm that looks like a sphere that surrounds your world and makes it makes a beautiful sky around your world. We're also going to talk about effects on the camera that make the world look dusty and ambient and really moody. So my games are always really moody. Um, and by the way, uh, I run a game studio. And so half of my time is spent making video games and selling them. And then the other half of my time is spent teaching them. It's an interesting business model. Uh, we mentioned this on the first webinar. It's kind of like if Blizzard was making games, but also selling courses or teaching people how to make those games. So that's sort of my business model. So if you actually look on the Switch store or Xbox or PlayStation or Apple, you'll find my games. They're called Pinstripe and Neversong. The second thing we're going to talk about is painting the terrain. So if we jump into Unity, we're going to do that in a second. All you got to do is paint the terrain using your mouse. So I'm just going to be using a very simple mouse here. You can use whatever you want. A lot of people think you have to have a tablet and one of those cool gloves and a, and a, a pen and paint and sculpt the terrain. You definitely can do that, but what we're going to do is just use a mouse. And that's how I make my games. And in fact, my 2D games and my 3D games are all created with just a simple mouse. Then finally, we're going to paint prefabs onto the terrain, which is a really strange thing to say. If you don't know what a prefab is, it's kind of like a prefab house or, well, we could say a prefab lamp or a prefab chair. They're just chairs, or not chairs, they're game objects that are called prefabs because they can be duplicated over and over again and painted around the scene. So for example, if I wanted to paint tree prefabs, I could paint them all over our scene, have, the have them have random rotation and random scale. So it looks like there's a bunch of different styles of trees when in reality, it's just one tree. So guys, let's get to it. Let's open up Unity, all right? So this is exciting because this is actually my current, my studio's current game that we're working on right now. And this game is actually at GDC. That's the, the game developer conference right now. So this is our third commercial release. So I'm going to sort of open this project up here for you and show you how all this game works and how we're making it. Oh, Thomas, real quick. 
We're uh, we're losing your mic a little, and maybe it's okay. Unity is pushing the mic. But uh, even if you yeah, just want to try here. changing back, yeah, just don't want to miss anything you're saying. Oh yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, let's see if we can do it. a um. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, let's see here. Check one two one two. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, that's going much better. Yep. I'll let you know. Okay, let's Cheers. let's see how this this goes, and you can just just interrupt me if if it keeps cutting out. We'll try and figure it out. We'll do. We'll do. All right. So we're going to open up this project here. And this is my current project that is actually at GDC. So if you guys missed that from my mic uh, cutting out, this project is currently at GDC. And so right now, I've actually deleted everything from the game. And just to show you guys, don't worry, I'm not going to save the project. I've deleted everything from the game. And now all we've got is this terrain. So look how big basic this looks it's this flat terrain okay there's no, no skybox there's no fog there's nothing right but let's go ahead and hit play here i want to show you what the world actually looks like with the effects and the skybox isn't that crazy it's just a it's just an image that's splashed around me almost like painted on a sphere. Maybe you've seen Truman Show. It's like that, it's just painted around the world. So I'm gonna open that up in Photoshop for you guys. So this is actually the skybox that's painted in our world, okay? It's just a simple image. The cool part about this, guys, is I didn't illustrate most of this. In fact, this is really all it is. This is something I downloaded from the Asset Store. It's called the Unity Asset Store. I just downloaded this sky here. It was like 20 bucks for like 10 different skies. And then I just painted over top of them this cool little tower here. And that was with the help of my buddy Santiago who did the illustration for this tower. So ultimately guys, right off the bat, you can make a flat terrain look incredible. Now, how am I getting this beautiful blending here? How am I getting that? There's no like hard edge here. Well, that's the fog, okay? So this is especially true in older games. In old games like uh, Silent Hill, there was a lot of dense gray fog and that was because it was accounting for a lot of things clipping far away or culling out. You couldn't have a lot of things on screen, so once something entered the fog, they'd cull it out. And it's also a great way to make a moody looking game. So right here, I can actually turn off my fog and you can see why we want to turn on the fog. Look at that. Doesn't look very good anymore, does it? So that's why we're turning on the fog, okay? And then finally, let's talk about the effects on the camera, okay? And then we're gonna jump into the terrain and painting the terrain. But right now, I just wanna make sure there's clarity here, how to make your scene look good almost immediately. So this is called a post-processing volume. All that, all that means is it's a, a volume or a big square. Let me show you in the actual scene here. It's a big square. That includes, like if I make it a uh, local volume, this big giant square, you can't see it, but it's surrounding our world here. And actually we can add a collider here to see it. There it is. So if I make this big square here, if I make it, uh, let's see here, maybe 50 by 50 by 50, we can create this giant volume that once you enter this volume, it creates an effect on the camera. I know that's confusing. Let me, let me explain here. How about let's make it global so that we don't have to worry about it ever entering that zone. Okay. So if the player, enters a zone, that's why you would use a local volume, but a global volume, it's gonna, the effects are gonna be applied everywhere. So here's what it looks like without the post-processing volume, which is now global. If I turn it off, very simplistic looking, right? But when I turn it on, it changes the mood and the coloring and adds something called bloom. Bloom is when your lights kind of glow so it's making our world feel alive just with what's called post-processing effects added to our camera, okay? 
So let's move on to the terrain now. Once we've got this scene looking great, just with a flat terrain, we can start painting the terrain, okay? So I'm gonna select my terrain here. And there's this really cool component here uh, called terrain, obviously. And if we go to paint terrain here, we can actually start painting texture onto our terrain, okay? So let's go to our spawn point here. I'm gonna press F on spawn point to focus, that's where our player is gonna spawn. So the first thing that I like to do when I'm working with terrain is I like to create a 3D cube and just place it on the terrain. The reason why is because it's really, really important to have a reference image or a reference object uh, to determine the scale of your world. So something I always think about is a default primitive box that's built into Unity is about half the size of a regular person. So it's about maybe two and a half feet tall, okay? Maybe three feet tall. So if I hit play here, we can see that is true. See, it's about up to my waist. So that's great when you're painting terrain because that gives you an idea of how wide your paths should be, how big a mountain should be. So it's really good to have a object there at all times to help you know how big your world should be, okay? So let's go ahead and start painting on the terrain. I'm gonna click the paintbrush, click paint texture here. And you can see here with the help of my 3D modeler, Felipe, he's downloaded some textures. We didn't make these from scratch. We've just downloaded them from the Unity Asset Store. And he's placed them into our swatches panel or our terrain layers panel here. And we could start painting, okay? So let's actually paint some dirt, maybe a dirt path. If we scroll down here, we have all these different brushes we can use for various, um, well, brushes or shapes or textures added to the terrain. So let's bring down the brush size to about three, okay? And let's start painting a path. See how easy this is? Look at that. So I'm just gonna paint a path. Now, here's the thing about painting on terrain. Some of you might wanna make a really toony looking game, maybe like, um, I don't know, Breath of the Wild or even more toony like Wind Waker. I don't know if many of you have played that game. That's one of my favorite games from my childhood. Wind Waker is very stylized, has harsh, clean edges. You can't really do that out of the box with the terrain tool in Unity. So we're gonna make more blurry paths, okay? So there's, there's some cool paths. Let's add some circles here just to make them look like they're closed, okay? There we go. Very cool, okay. So let's hit play. So now you can see we have this beautiful path, okay? It was really that simple. Now, it's so funny because whenever I'm working with the terrain tool, I'm thinking maybe I need to download some more like gizmos and things to add to the terrain to make it more interesting. When in reality, there's probably enough out of the box with Unity that comes with Unity to make the terrain look more interesting. So what I often do is I'll just say, instead of downloading something cool like a new set of rocks or downloading signposts or downloading uh, a, a grass shader to make really cool looking grass, I'll always sort of test and say, well, maybe I just need to paint more texture. So in this case, maybe we can paint some more darker texture here, some dark grass, just to add some interest like this. Look at that. Maybe drop the opacity down, create some blending here. So you just add subtle details here. So I'm just clicking, 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 and just adding subtle details. We can even do it with some dirt, just very subtle patches of dirt to make it look realistic. Now, obviously you can, you can download some automation plugins that will change the texture based on the height of your terrain and all that. But I actually like to have like complete control, artistic control, and Felipe, who's my 3D modeler at my studio. Um, this, this is how he works as well, okay? So we've, we've added all these patches here. We could even do grass dirt. We could do full grass. So look how we're just slowly removing a lot of that looping or that tiling effect. Right here, it's very tiled, see that? But right here, we're just clicking all over the place to make it feel more natural, okay? All right. So let's hit play really quick, see how this looks. 
All right, so now it's looking a lot more realistic. Pretty cool. Awesome. Okay, so how do we add more interest here? Well, let's start adding some height to the terrain. So I'm gonna to go to my paint tool here and go to raise or lower terrain. So what we could do is we could raise up the terrain like this, right? Now, if you're not intentional, it's gonna look really cheap and crappy, right? It's gonna look like a silly video game editor. I remember the old Far Cry games had a uh, map editor like this. And so, you know, you, if you're not intentional, it's gonna look cheap and kind of silly, right? So instead of raising and lowering the terrain, what I'm gonna do is go back in time and actually use a tool called Set Height. This is my favorite tool. And the reason why is because you can create paths with it and you can also create large sort of mountains or walls around you as you're exploring a world. Kind of like my, what you might see in Resident Evil 4. So if you wanna make a path look more intentional, make it look realistic like it's actually been walked on, you can actually dig in, okay? So I'm gonna dig into the path to make it look more realistic. The way we do that is we hold shift and left click and it's gonna tell us the current height of this terrain. It's currently set to zero. Well, we can't go lower, so what we need to do is first set the height to something like 100, flatten it. Now it's gonna move it up for us. It still saved the texture, so that's okay. I'm gonna move the spawn point up so that we don't spawn underneath the terrain. Not too high though, because we'll fall and break our legs. We don't want to do that. <laughs> so let's pull it down here. And now we can actually use the set height tool again. But in this case, again, if I click shift and then left click, it tells us our height is 100. So what if we set the painting of the height to 98 and then click? Look at that. So now it's digging into a path. What if we did 99? Just one unit lower like that. That looks pretty cool. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the brush height or the brush size to six and I'm gonna paint onto this path. It often helps just to zoom up like this, top view and just paint. Now don't worry, it looks kind of silly right now but what we're gonna do is we're gonna smooth it all. So that we're gonna use the smooth tool in just a second. So I'm just painting the path here. Awesome, I love that. So as you can see here, if I come up here, again, I'm not in play mode, guys. It kind of looks a little silly, doesn't it? So why not smooth the edges? So I'm gonna go to the Smooth tool, and we're gonna smooth the height here. So if I set the opacity to something like 61, the brush size to be pretty large, and just do a quick, smooth, soft brush over everything, and then hit play, We'll see here if this works. Well, I'm spawning underneath, oh, let's clear our save data. Gotta make sure I set the spawn location to the right. There we go. So now we have paths dug in. Look how much this added to our world just by digging into the ground. Really, really pretty. So what if we added some massive mountains around our path here? Well, that's not too hard. Actually, all you gotta do is just select one of the brushes you like. I actually like this one for mountains. I scale up the brush size, increase the opacity, and we're gonna go to raise or lower terrain, and we're just gonna start raising up the terrain, okay? All around the player. This is just to give almost a vista around the player, make them feel locked in. I know for father, we really like the player to, to feel cozy, and closed in, again, like Silent Hill, like Resident Evil, even like Half-Life, the player is on a set linear path. And so that's, that's what we like to do for our games. You don't have to lock the player in though, but that's what we're gonna do here. I'm also gonna change out the brush here, increase the size, and I'm actually gonna raise up this edge over here. I'm gonna make sure I save our scene here. My computer's starting to slow down a little bit. You always wanna be <laughs> careful when you're working with Unity. All right, and then I'm just gonna raise up one edge here. Look at this. So that's why we dug the path in first, because it would be a lot harder to dig in the path now that we actually have some elevated terrain over here, okay? I'm gonna hold shift and I can bring it down a little bit. Sweet. All right, let's raise it up just a little bit here and hit play and take a look at how this feels. 
Okay, we need to raise up our spawn point because we're falling through the ground. So let's bring it up a little bit. There we go. Clear our save data so that we actually spawn in the right location. There we go. Look at this, guys. So now our world, it just looks kind of realistic, right? And all we've done is just clicked. That's all we're doing is clicking. I love the terrain tool in Unity because I'm not the best when it comes to 3D modeling. That's Felipe, my 3D modeler, and he actually teaches in our program the Blender portion of the course. And I teach the terrain portion of the course. So as you can see here, it was pretty straightforward. Okay. So let's move on to the next thing here. I actually want to start painting some grass, some real grass, not some grass texture, but some actual grass coming out of the ground. Well, what we've got here is we've got this paint details tool here. And you can see here, if we click on one of these blades of grass, it's essentially like a swatch. It's going to start painting grass. Look at that. So I can just paint in some grass here all over our scene. And it's just painting that grass. And this grass is going to blow in the wind. It's going to look beautiful. Now, how did we get this to work? I mean, where did this grass even come from? Is it built in with Unity? No, we actually downloaded an asset from the Unity Asset Store. It was like a $30 asset. I'm not sure the exact cost. And that's it. You just add the swatches to your palette and then you start painting. Now, obviously guys, you can go in and change these grass textures if you want. Um, but we really like the way these look, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna change them. Something I teach in my programs and on my YouTube channel and even apply for my own work when I release my own games is I basically say, you know what, Thomas, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, you don't have to be so proud. If you have, if you find other people's work, so for example, these grass blades, if you find that they work for you, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel and create new grass blades. Just paint them and be done with your, your level. All right, let's paint some taller grass pieces, maybe some bushes. Look at that. And this is going to be optimized for Unity by default, generally, generally. You might have to do some optimization later, but, but you can see here the grass really looks beautiful with our world. Now, we were really intentional with coloring, so we did tweak all the colors here. Um, so I love orange and this gray sort of army green. So that's sort of the color palette of this level. And so we were intentional with the coloring, but the texturing, the shape of the grass, that's all stuff we purchased from the asset store. Okay, so we've got some grass here, but you can see when we zoom out, they cull out. Culling is when it just removes from the renderer. That's done automatically. You can change those values if you want. Guys, this is a good thing. This means that Unity doesn't have to render everything at once, okay? All right, so let's paint just a little bit of grass here, maybe some here as well. Just finish up here. And I think that's good. Now, let's talk about painting trees. Trees are a little bit different because they're an actual mesh. A mesh is a 3D model. But we have basically a palette of trees here that you can paint. It's kind of like Bob Ross, right? Instead of a brush that paints a tree, uh, I know that he would choose specific brushes that kind of looked like trees when he would dab on the canvas. We're actually using real 3D meshes. Again, these were downloaded from the Unity Asset Store, right? Obviously, we could create these meshes if we wanted to. Um, but with trees specifically, me and Felipe like to download assets from the Asset Store because what's called a shader, which is a script that makes the uh, tree look a certain way. Some shaders can actually make the leaves blow in the wind. So instead of animating every leaf, it's just a shader doing it for you. So let me show you. I can decrease my brush size here, decrease the density so that I can just place one tree at a time. Look at this. So next time you guys are playing a game like Breath of the Wild or playing a game like uh, Elden Ring, um, obviously don't discredit the, I mean, those games are incredible. The studios are just brilliant. But it's important to note, it's as easy as just painting trees. Once they're made, painting the trees 
is a lot easier than you think. Now, some of these trees are a little bit smaller than others, right? Like, that's tiny. Can we make it bigger? Yeah, we can make it bigger. So if I actually go back in time, there's a ton of settings over here in my terrain tab. So I can increase the tree height, the minimum and max values. Isn't that really cool? Like there's a slider over here, min max values, increase it to be pretty tall and then decrease the minimum. And so now they're much taller. Okay. So I'm going to paint some of those trees, paint some of these as well. Just start painting those trees all over the place. A few more pine trees here. Maybe go a little bit taller here. We could paint these all over the place. Now, how's the computer going to handle all these trees over here? Like if I have a bunch of trees over here, is that, is this tree here going to be rendered all the way back there? Well, it, it looks like it, right? It looks like trees are being rendered back there just like they're being rendered here. Look at all this detail. Do I really want that many trees back there? Well, it's not actually rendering the same tree. It's called an LOD. It's called a level of detail. So let's hit play really quick just so you can see how it looks and then let's talk about the LODs. So look how gorgeous this looks. It's beautiful and we've got some flickering back there. I'm gonna fix that in just a second. We're gonna talk about that. But look at what we've got here. The world just looks like it's coming to life, right? Once you get all of your swatches or your colors, your prefabs, your textures ready to go, once you have that palette completed, and that's really the work. The hard work is figuring out how you want it to look. Once it's all there, you just paint and create your world. Creating levels is not that hard. So let's take a look at these LODs over here. Okay, what is an LOD? Well, as I move towards a tree, they're gonna pop into existence, okay, with different LODs, AKA level of detail. So for example, let's open up this tree here. I'm gonna go to edit tree. I'm gonna select the actual prefab and I'm gonna double click on it. Look, we've got these three LODs. By default, they're all active before you hit play. But the moment you hit play, Unity, if you have this component, it's called a component, if you have it on the actual tree, attached to the tree, it's essentially a script that says, if the camera is this far away, swap it to LOD1, swap it to LOD2, swap it to LOD3, and then cull. So I can actually change these values if I want to. I can drag it over here, Drag that over here. So as the camera gets further and further away, maybe we want it to call out a lot, a lot sooner. So this one in particular, look how low detail this is. Looks like a tree from Mario 64, right? That's the last one before it calls out, right? Now that's the benefit of downloading these assets from the Unity Asset Store. These LODs are sort of built in. Not in every asset pack, but in most cases, you're gonna have these LODs pre-built for you so that you don't have to worry about performance. Now, the next performance discussion I wanna have when it comes to painting objects on the terrain, and performance is a big deal, by the way, because if we're gonna make a Nintendo Switch game, it's essentially like making a game for mobile. So you really wanna be careful when it comes to your 3D art with performance. One of the things I want to talk about is called occlusion culling. So right now when we hit play, you'll notice that thing, look at that. The terrain is popping in and out of existence. Why is that? Well, that's because we haven't baked the occlusion data. Actually, it's using occlusion data from a previous scene. So it's really confused. It thinks that I don't need to see this, but I'm clearly looking at it, so it should show up. So if you bake occlusion, Here's a good example. I want to throw in a rock really quick. I'm going to talk, type in rock here. And I'm going to drag this one in. There we go. Just a big rock. Let's just do a huge rock, maybe really, really tall, just to show you what occlusion uh, culling really does. If I make this static, and all it means is it's not going to move. If I make it static, and then I click the occlusion tab up here and then bake, 
it's going to bake the data. You can see down here, it's slowly baking the occlusion data, okay? And what this does, you can see it, look at this. It's creating these blue cubes. And these blue cubes basically say, is there any hole or is there anything blocking this cube so that we can cut away the terrain, snip pieces out of it, because the player doesn't need to see it anyway. Why would you render it in the game? Why would you use up that RAM data, that memory, if you don't need it? So it's baked our occlusion data. So if I hit play here, let's actually drag the game view over here. And then over here, we're gonna hit play. If I go to visualization, look what's actually happening. Look at that. So look at the game view. And now look at what's actually being rendered. Now you're seeing some weird stuff happening here. This is just a idiosyncrasy with Unity. Um, when you're in visualization mode, it, it has it struggles with the game view. But generally speaking, what we're seeing here is all we need to see. So over here on the left side of the screen, that's actually all that's being rendered. Unity is doing this out of the box. Look at that. If I face the rock, look at the left side, guys. It's almost like it's casting a shadow of emptiness. That's a good thing, right? It means that data is not being rendered. So this is all to say that um, Unity, it's almost, we talked about this in, in the previous webinar. Working with an engine like Unity, you can also work with Unreal. Um, it's basically like, well, it's basically like playing Minecraft or Roblox. Like that's how easy the software is to use. Once you figure out the buttons and how things work, generally speaking, making video games is almost like playing them. So that's painting prefabs onto the terrain. It's pretty amazing how simple and easy it is. Now we can even use custom models if we wanted to. Let's say that Felipe's created a custom model like, um, well, I know that he has uh, some, some graves, so maybe a tombstone. So if you make a custom model, and by the way, we teach about custom modeling, that's the previous two webinars we did. If you have custom models that you created in Blender, you can drag those in to your scene here. So let's see here, this one, this one looks about right. So I'm gonna drag it into our scene, look at that. You just drag them in. Now obviously you could paint these on the terrain if you set up a swatch, a, a swatch to paint these prefabs, or you can just drag them in. We could even, well, what if we wanted a massive tombstone? That looks like something that might be an Elden Ring to be honest, a massive <laughs> tombstone hanging out in the middle of the terrain. If you wanted to, you could just have it hanging out here, right? So you can just drag in custom models into your scene. So if I hit play here, now we've got these custom models. It's a combination, and this is really what, where it comes to art direction and, and just keeping your head on straight when it comes to how you want your game to look. Let's turn off visualization really quick. Actually, we should probably bake the occlusion data now that we deleted that big giant rock. Just for clarity here, guys, the reason why this is cutting in and out here is because it thinks that that rock is still there, but we deleted it. Remember that big rock? We deleted it. Unity thinks it's still there. Why? Because we haven't rebaked the occlusion data. But anyway, we've got these <laughs> custom models here hanging out in the ground. We could probably bring them down a little bit, but they're floating now. But notice how everything kind of looks like it matches, right? It matches within our world. Just because you can click and paint pre-made assets doesn't mean you have to disregard your artistic integrity and also your, your own eye. So for me, I love hyper contrasty orange colors with low saturated worlds. I like simplistic stylized models that look hand painted. So we've got Felipe, my, my team's lead 3D modeler, and he also teaches in the program about Blender and Substance Painter. He creates custom models but he knows that they need to match the models we've downloaded from the asset store. And he also knows that those two, the assets and his models, they need to match the terrain, right? So it's, it's combining a variety of different um, skill sets and artists and combining them into a project that looks cohesive. And that really is the indie mindset. 
which is doing things as cheap as possible, but making it look cohesive and handmade. So guys, that's unity. That is unity. Um, it's pretty amazing because we've talked about this in the previous lectures, um, previous webinars. Unity is one of the four free tools. We've got Blender, Substance Painter, Photoshop, and Unity. Unity is where all of the, these, these tools come into play and you bring all those assets in. Guys, we teach about all of this at our program called 3D Art Pro. And we just started selling this program two days ago. It's 40% off. And originally there was 200 seats available. Now there's, I think, about 46 seats left. And by seats, just for clarity, what I mean is 40% coupon codes that give you also, obviously, access to the program, but also they give you my, my brand new 2D art program, totally free. So there are about 40 coupons left to get that massive discount and that free program. So what you're gonna get in the program is, well, me and my lead 3D modeler, again, we make games full time, like that's our job. We also sell these programs. So our current game is called Father. All of these skills here you see on the screen, we use these in our game Father. And we've spent six months creating a program while also creating Father. And the program includes me and Felipe, our skills, everything we know, um, or at least everything, not everything we know, but everything we've, we've been using for father, at least the art side of father, is in the program. Blender modeling, Photoshop texturing, Substance Painter, you can actually paint on to models. And that's actually our, our lecture from yesterday, if you wanna watch it, it's totally free. Unity terrain, humanoid modeling and rigging and weight painting and moving the bones around, and then architecture. Architecture is taking small, what's called modular assets, modeling them in Blender, bringing them into Unity and creating a castle or creating a large house with all these different assets, staircases, floor pieces, wall pieces, door pieces. And we also cover asset flipping, which we talked about today. Asset flipping is when you take a variety of assets, custom models, but also assets from the asset store, and you flip them and you shouldn't be afraid to do this. It's a dirty word in the industry, but you shouldn't be afraid to do it because it, especially as an indie, you don't have an infinite budget. You don't have a lot of time, so it's okay to take pre-made assets and create a world. And then we also offer all of our models and files for download in the program so that you can study them more. So if you guys wanna master 3D art, you can join the program. Now, my larger flagship program called Full-Time Game Dev, it's a much bigger program. We have reviews for that program because we have 3,000 students. Right now, we don't have any reviews for 3D Art Pro because it's brand new, but I did wanna let you guys know that this program is very similar to my bigger program, and we, we have incredible reviews. I think the lowest review we've gotten is, you can go to fulltimegamedev.com slash reviews. It's like a four and a half star. Uh, so at least the ones I've looked at. So I mean, <laughs> great reviews, very, very low refund rate. Happy students. Um, so. All that said, guys, if you want to join the program, it's 40% off below. And again, you're going to get 2D Art Pro, my 2D program, totally free. And you're going to get 40% off 3D Art Pro. So this lasts for the next, I think we've got five days left. It, it ends on Tuesday next week. Um, and about there's only about 40 coupon codes left, and then it's sold out. So we may add a few more coupons after that if we have to, because it's selling much faster than I thought, <laughs> to be honest. So anyway, uh, check that out below. And guys, I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned a lot here. And really quick, the I guess the cherry on top of all of this is there is a Discord community um, for 2D students and 3D students all focused on creating breathtaking, beautiful artwork. It's a private Discord community, and it's active right now. Uh, there's students hanging out on there right now. Very helpful uh, community, so be sure to check the link out below if you're interested. Love it. Thomas, thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, yesterday, you mentioned about just this all getting addictive because you feel like God, and I can totally <laughs> see why. It is. It, it, I mean, I hope you. I thought maybe you felt that way. It's like wow, yeah. like this. It's really fun. Yeah. Well, and you're just like, and we'll put a little tree here and a little mountain <laughs> there, and just whatever. Yeah. But it is so cool. It's it's amazing where this stuff has come. Just the yeah. how 
how much you can focus on your creativity yeah not have to like make every single tree and everything. and you can like, like jonah you can if you want and that's why we teach right. this stuff you know like 3d art pro half of the course is about doing it all custom um felipe my my lead 3d modeler guys if you want to meet felipe he's in the previous two webinars um but but he and i always are talking and we're, we're saying okay, do we, do we really need to make this custom today? And Felipe's like, yes, I want to make the gun custom because the gun is on the front of the camera. Like if a first person, mm. it's, a, it's a custom model. But then we have a discussion. We go, yeah, but like, what about the terrain? Like, do we really need to make everything custom? Do we really need to paint every texture? And we both agree, no, no, we don't need to do that. Um, so it's really, a, it's like figuring out a balance of where you want to spend most of your time doing flipping, which we cover in the course, or custom modeling, which we cover in the course. Love it. Well, and it's so cool. You can you can take it from the perspective of what makes the gameplay better. Yep. Right. And what then focus on that. It's so awesome. Uh, real quick for everyone watching, please drop any comments or questions you have. We have a little more time with Thomas so we can ask him any questions you might have. And also just to reiterate, the links for the course are in the description. They're pinned at the top of the comments and they'll be emailed to you along with the replay. And Thomas, uh, before we dive before we dive into some of the questions from people, there was one we didn't get to yesterday, but a couple people had asked, and I wanted to pop it in here. What what are kind of the minimum requirements as far as the hardware you need to yeah. actually get into Unity? Because uh, it's a bummer if you dive in and then all of a sudden you're yeah. just in a sluggy place. But most, I think I. <sighs> I am not a tech guy. I never have been, you know, for the last half of my life has been, I don't focus on the PC. I just make games. Right. And I can tell you that it, like this course focuses specifically on independent games. Okay. So if you've got a crappy computer, then that's actually okay because you're building on the platform no. that most of the indie audience is probably going to be using, or maybe not most of them, but you're, you're building for that lowest denominator of people on kind of crappy computers. So all that said, if you're making independent artwork, indie games with like independent looking 3D art, trendy, uh, stylized art, like you see um, on the slide here. Like if you're making artwork like that, then pretty much any computer should be totally fine. Like you could, you could be on like a five, six year old laptop right. and you'd be fine making artwork like this. Right. It, I love that. So you're building for the place people are playing. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The lowest denominator, at least. I think most people on like Steam, for example, they're playing on a on a decent computer. I mean, it's not that expensive now to get a decent computer. Right. Um, but even people who are on like a two hundred dollar computer. Your game should run on that computer. If you're making indie games, it should run. And so if like you should be making the game and while you're in Unity, if it's running slow, you need to figure out why it's running slow. There's usually right. a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with your hardware, but rather, well, it's it's the hardware's fault, but you should be able to figure out in Unity ways to optimize your game for an indie audience. Um, so that's why I say you shouldn't have a super fast computer making indie games, at least starting out. Right. That's, yeah, that's such a great, do you test your games on different computers as yes. you're going through the process? Yes. Yeah. Well, the way that, the way that it works is, um, just, this is actually part of my bigger program called full-time game dev, but I'll give you guys the nitty gritty. Basically when you're working on an indie game, there's so much more associated with making a game than just making the game. So for example, beta testing, alpha testing, marketing, uh, publishers, platform deals, licensing deals. One of the things that I teach is I say, well, if you're going to be doing quality assurance, which you definitely should be. That's going to happen towards the end of your game's development after like an alpha test. You're probably going to want to hire or at least get a studio involved, like a publisher, to spend $10,000 on helping you optimize. Mm. So 3D is especially difficult. So I don't like to lie to anybody. 3D is way harder to optimize than 2D. Mm. There's a lot more going on with 3D. So if you guys make a really, especially like a hyper-polished 3D game, just keep in mind that you don't just launch it, right? You you go okay. Now I need to figure out how to optimize this thing. Now it doesn't mean you can't optimize it on your own, but just keep in mind it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time, 
And so for me, I like to work with publishers because publishers say, hey, here's 100 grand and we're going to spend 10 of that on optimization. And you say, thank you. And you don't have to get a loan. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So just keep that in mind. Right. Uh, and uh, this kind of tags into the question I was just going to ask. But uh, one man show was asking, if we need help, tips or advice for our current and future, where can we contact you if you are available? <laughs> so obviously the course is a great resource. Yep. But I'm also hoping you can call out your YouTube and other yeah, places sure, like sure. that. Uh, yeah. where can people find more information from you? I know you give a lot of education away. Yeah. And so I like to, my, my, uh, one of my little core tenants with my studio is honesty. I don't get to questions. I don't answer people's individual questions. I can't, I would go crazy, uh, because there's, there's so many that pop up. So I try and offer like tentacles of help. And so one of the tentacles is my YouTube channel. Like I've got a ton of con like, I think thousand, maybe a couple hundred videos, at least live streams. I live stream all the time. I answer Q and A's. Um, so there's that. And then there's also my personal assistant. And so you can, you can email Thomas at fulltimegamedev.com. And if he has the time, he can help answer the question or he might forward it to me. Uh, if you're especially, uh, squeaky, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So if you really want to get my attention, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't say this, but just email him a lot and I'll see if I can answer the question. Um, but yeah, I like to be honest. It's really hard for me to get to people's questions. So that's why I have the programs. That's why I have YouTube channels. That's why I have a personal assistant. Right. So yeah. And maybe if they pay enough, you'll <laughs> do it. Right. Yeah. A thousand dollars. I'll answer your question about 2D sprites. <laughs> <laughs> Love. Um, no, they, and uh, let's just keep going here with it. So uh, Jazz was asking, I'm working on a game right now. What's the number one thing I can do to make something that really stands out? Super into strong narrative. So I love this, not just about like the design, but the whole game. Mm -hmm. What do you think makes a really kick-ass game? Yeah, so especially with indie, there's first the visual discussion. Do you want to throw up my screen really quick? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm into color. Color is really important with indie games. Guys, I didn't just pick these colors randomly. So let's, let's, let's just move aside the 3d art pro packaging here. That's a not really that color scheme doesn't really match the background here, but what you can see here is called, uh, well, obviously most, of you know, this complementary colors, right? I'm not sure if this is an actual, uh, triad of, of colors, three different colors that are sort of creating a, a triangle on the color wheel. But something to keep in mind, this is especially true. I love Elden Ring. I keep talking about Elden Ring and everyone should be talking about Elden Ring because obviously there's a ton of other factors, but what they do right is color. There's clearly a color palette. And so I would recommend if you really want your game to pop and, and, you, and you're not the greatest artist, you can make a game. Uh, there's videos on my YouTube channel about this. You can make a game pop with two colors. If there's, hmm. if they're, they're chosen um, strategically. So orange and green, or think about Christmas, red and green, right? Mm -hmm. um, contrasting colors give your game an identity. And people, when they see it, they can almost smell, like they, they can taste the flavor of your game with just a few colors. So mm. color is a really important visual way to stand out. When it comes to narrative and story, contrast or complementary uh, elements in a story are what I lean towards as well. Here's an example. Uh, my first game, I, I love contrast. I'm a, I'm a really, really big fan of contrast. Uh, so uh, contrast in story is, and then we'll talk about contrast in music as well. Contrast in story is, um, for example, with my first game, Pinstripe. And by the way, guys, this story was so effective, a studio in Hollywood bought it, and it's because of the contrast. Contrast is a minister goes to hell to find his daughter. <laughs> contrast, right? Sounds now, like most a, of you probably that's not joke. contrast. I love All that. ministers go to hell. No, <laughs> <laughs> but a minister goes to hell. That's contrast, right? Um, that my next game, Never Song, it's about a little boy who, spoiler alert, finds out that it's actually an old fifty-year-old man in a dream reliving his childhood. So it's uh. contrast of age, right? Huh. Contrast to my next game is father, a very conservative religious father who's 50 years old is looking for his missing daughter who is very trendy. She's secular is what you would call it. 
uh, very, very um, opposite of her father. So if you're looking for a story element uh, or a story that stands out, throw some contrast in there mm. and people will find it very, very interesting. Um, and then finally with music, contrast is another great, just contrast is the answer here. With music, um, my music, or at least for my previous games, I hired a musician for my third game, but for my previous two games, it's very playful music like xylophones, uh, toy pianos, um, flutes, uh, sort of, uh, I think it pizzicato strings is I think yeah. the technical term, mixed with very haunting, droning, atmospheric music underneath it. Uh, so you get the term hauntingly beautiful when you play my games. It's a, it's a contrast. It's a contrast. Um, so throw contrast into all of the elements of your game um, and see if that can catch people's attention. That's so cool. Yeah. I love it. That, that's, I've heard artists of all sorts point to that and it's yeah. so effective. Yeah. Are, uh, also just curious, do you write much? Uh, write music? No, no, just write. Like when Stories? you're coming up with, yeah, the game, yes. the game. To, are you just working that muscle frequently, irregardless? Yeah, so with of games, you can get away with sort of BSing your way through story because you've got all these other artistic elements that can fluff around a really bad story and make it work. Um, so I don't write the stories out generally. I just sort of play with them and then mm. they sort of flesh out and then they just they work themselves out. And it's funny because Felipe's like. I need you to write out the story for father, our current game. <laughs> Thomas, I need you to write it out because I don't understand it. And I'm like, I'll write it out later, but like, let's get the game done. But it's in here. Right. Uh, but I do write like novel. I've, I've, I've written a novel. So like that, that's different. Um, but they, again, they all hinge on contrast. That's, that's one of my favorite things. So I, I love that so much. Okay. Uh, got some more questions here. Uh, near, near, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, was saying, Hey, Thomas, I loved your full time game dev course, uh, but that was making a 2D game. Will you do a 3D game version of that? In general, is a lot of that stuff applicable to both? Are you thinking no. about updating? No. No. To answer your question, if this was called 3D Game Pro, the course, if it was called 3D Game Pro, it would be about making a 3D game. The art, courses i have 2d art and 3d art pro and again you get 2d art pro completely free those are hyper focused on taking your art skills to the next level mm. now i will say if you're a full-time game dev student you should already have a module about making a 3d game um it's new it, new ish it was added last year so i would double check that a friend of mine um did that portion his name is david whaley he made a 3d game called the first tree so you should check that out and and see if that's something that that you can learn from because that's that's in the course now in full time game dev. Cool. Well, and that's just a call out too. You are regularly updating these courses oh, yeah. as well, right? Yeah. As you find new value and stuff. Correct. And lifetime access for everybody. So I mean, if you join 3 ER Pro, there's likely going to be updates to the program and additional modules. So you get those whenever you want. Love it. Uh, and then a last question here. Uh, Jazz was asking, is itch a good starting point? For I mean, Jazz, I, I'm not so sure what you mean here. Um, do you want to clarify? Um, like itch, uh, itch IO. Okay, itch IO. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. I think I think if you're gonna make a game, release a crap. It your first game should be crappy. That's like the rule. Um, you like my my daughter is four years old. She's not gonna go play soccer like a high schooler, hmm. she's going to play really crappy soccer. And like she play, she was on a team last year and they just sort of ran around and didn't even kick the ball. <laughs> the same is true with your first game. You're not just going to jump right in and make a great game. It's going to be crap. I mean, trust me. I mean, if you guys go to newgrounds.com and type in Atmos games, A-T-M-O-S games, you can see some of my very first games on there that were called flash games. Some of you might know what flash games were. Those were internet games uh, way back in like early 2000s. And maybe 2010 max. Um, th they're crappy games. They're really, really crappy games. Uh, some of them are even ripoffs. Like I ripped off Geometry Wars and made a game that was crap when I was like 17 years old. So you should release crappy games. And the place to do it is itch.io. Embrace the negative reviews. Let people crap on your project because you're going to need that thick skin when you actually decide to make a commercial release. Right. Uh yeah, well, I love your mentality there so much. You've said that time and time again, but it is yeah. like just 
get something out there and then learn and fix in the next one, right? That's a yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's really about guys. It's, it, the same is true with 3D Art Pro. When you're making 3D art, I have to tell myself this. So whenever I I say harsh harsh truths, I'm talking to myself. Here's one: uh, stop taking yourself so seriously. Like it's okay. Like your your project is not you. Uh, your game is not you. It's not your identity. So take it easy. Have a good time. Don't worry so much about being perfect. It's just a silly project. And and suddenly, if you let go of that mentality, uh, it's a lot easier to release content. 3D, right. 3D content, 3D models, 2D, 2D art, or full games. You know, it just gets a lot easier. Right. I, I feel like that's solid advice for life in general. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, are you cool? We do have two more questions yeah, sure, that sure. just rolled in here. Uh, Deepu was asking, uh, can I use terrain for creating a forest, especially for a VR quest game? Yeah. So mainly with respect to performance optimization. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the terrain, the terrain tool is optimized already as long as you're using occlusion culling. Um, the, the, when it gets troublesome is when you're not using LODs with certain objects and you're also not baking your occlusion, your occlusion culling. So just keep that in mind. Like if you're if you're gonna bake a massive forest, the problem isn't the terrain. The terrain is the the, the Unity terrain is really cool because it actually I don't know what the right word is compresses the further mm -hmm. and further away it gets, and it also mip maps. That's when a texture changes to a much lower res further away because mm -hmm. it's not gonna be, need to be high res when you're looking at it far away. So Unity terrain is doing this already, like behind the scenes by default. The problem is if you're painting these beautiful, gorgeous oak trees everywhere, you need to make sure those are culling out at the right point. Mm. And also the LODs are tweaking at the right points per your hardware. Uh, so like if you're making a Nintendo Switch game or like, I don't know, a VR game for mobile, I don't even know what that would be. But if you're making like a mobile <laughs> or Switch game, you want to be super careful. Like it, it's like uh, you're basically building a game for like 2010. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Right. Right. Uh, and then this wasn't a question, but I just love this game in. I draw pictures said, I remember hearing Thomas say that my first game would be <laughs> crap when I started games and I felt really defiant and thought I'd prove him wrong. He was right. <laughs> Hey, I always say if my games are crap, then yours will be because I'm the best. No, I'm kidding. But no, everyone's game is going to be crap. And that's just the way it goes. And you got to like you got to learn to love it. And it, I'm I'm guilty of not doing that because I'm telling you, like this week, uh, I was really hesitant to launch my father demo at GDC for one. But we, we kind of committed to that. So we had to do that. So we launched the demo at GDC. But my audience was like, well, can we play it? And I was on my, on my channel, you know, and and I was like, no. But now I'm realizing, no, Thomas, you got to do what you said. So I'm releasing the demo. It's live. Uh, and it's crap. And by crap, I mean, it's just t horribly optimized. Like if most people, when they play the game, it's going to be running at like 15 frames per second, which is horrible. It should be like 60. And that's just because I haven't optimized it. But we just released it and said, you know what, whatever. So we're release crappy games you'll, you'll get used to it. it'll be all right and i have to tell that to myself yeah last question uh but this just came in and it's so worth answering daniel is saying what if i have i what if i am 14 years old and i love making games is this course for me am i too young no uh i, I definitely want to don't want to take a 14 year old's money so talk to your parents right. um but and in fact reach out to thomas at fulltimegamedev.com uh, and, and say, Thomas told me to email you because I don't even want your money. I just, I think I should just give it to you. So, um, yes, it's for you. I would just say for me personally, I started learning action script, which is basically JavaScript when I was in eighth grade and that's, that's coding. Um, and a buddy of mine, this is funny too. A buddy of mine, when I was in high school, he was like two years younger than me. I think he was 16. He was a master at Blender. And that was before Blender updated its UI. Mm. And that's the user interface. It was old. Like if you look at the old versions of Blender, it's like, oh my gosh, it looks kind of like, um, like 
CAD or like an engineering software. And he was a master at it. And he was, he was really, really good at it. So my point is, is that me and my friends, you know, we were, we were learning this stuff when we were in high school. Um, so there's no reason you can't do it. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I tell people all the time, I'm not a very smart person. Um, I'm really not. Uh, I just sort of, I guess I have, I'm pretty resilient. Like I'll power through self doubt and actually get things done. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, definitely for you, but email me. I don't want, I don't, I don't know. I feel like you're too young to be buying something from me. I, so. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, also I'm just like, man, anything you start at that age, you're going to be killing it. In yeah, your 20s. Yeah. It's like, uh, Thomas, we have to wrap up for time. Everyone who's joined us here today, thank you so much. Once again, the links are in the description and the comments. Go check out the course. Uh, that discount will be there until Tuesday. And also go check out the other two events. I know I've called them out, but they were a total blast. On YouTube, they're independent events. And later tonight, all three will be stitched together on the Spotlight event page so you can binge the whole week nice. of content. And uh, before we wrap up, Thomas, uh, was there anything else after this whole week of diving in, any little bit of advice you wanted to give game developers starting out? It can be a rough journey if you're just diving yeah. into the software and everything. So any yeah. little nugget for the end of this week? Yeah, when I started learning Stick Shift, I was embarrassed because my dad was really good at it. I was terrible at it. I, I think I probably ruined his clutch. I then got in a wreck immediately after I got my first stick shift car, after I learned stick shift, I got in a wreck immediately after. Oof. And the point is, and it was because I, I, I uh, stalled the car or whatever, because I still didn't know how to do it, but now I'm great at it. Like it's, it's all second age. Like stick shift is easy. Like it's no problem. Um, the same is true with 3d. The same is true with 3d modeling guys. Like if you buy the course, you're gonna feel confused and we're doing our very best. It's, it's a hard thing to teach, but we're doing our very best to, and I, I, I have little, uh, like coaching sessions in the middle of the course, like, don't give up. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay because it's hard. It's really, really hard. But i mentioned stick shift because it's just like it. It's, it becomes second nature. Mm. So at one point you don't even realize what your hands are doing when you're doing 3d modeling. Um, so just keep that in mind, guys, and don't give up. Love it. Thomas, thank you so much. It's been a total blast this week to really yep. dive into everything with you. And a couple people were asking, uh, yes, this is part three. We did two other events. They're on the YouTube, and I dropped the spotlight link there in the comments. Uh, but Thomas, it's been a total blast. Everyone yep. who's here, please hop in the comments. Thank Thomas for his time. And like and subscribe to the Spotlight channel if you had a good time here today we're consistently doing events like this and always having a blast thomas thank you so much everyone watching have a wonderful day yep thanks